Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, it's Thomas Seal. I cover technology, media, and telecoms here in London for Bloomberg. Um, often, my job means writing about how global businesses are being regulated here in the UK, which has become a more interesting story post-Brexit. So I'm delighted to be speaking to Will Hayter today. Uh, he's the Senior Director of Digital Markets at the CMA. He's been at the CMA since 2015. Uh, apart from a year at the Cabinet Office to work on the Brexit transition. Um, today, Will's running uh, a new part of the CMA, the Digital Markets Unit, newish, uh, which is expected to be given new powers to regulate the biggest tech companies, uh, ones it deems to have strategic market status, or SMS. Will's also responsible for the CMA's more recent review of AI foundation models, which is ongoing. He's not involved in merger cases, like a certain video game deal, uh, which may, people may want us to talk about. So we're limited on how much he can say about that, but uh, there's plenty else to be talking about. So um, today's theme at the conference has been quite subtle, uh, AI. Uh, CMA is already studying the AI market, despite it being quite recent, uh, quite new. So you know, Will, what, what's the urgency in, uh, in launching this review already? Yeah, thanks, Tom, and thanks very much for having me. So we, we've just completed an initial review of AI foundation models. So not the whole of AI, of course, but an important part of it, and certainly the part that is underpinning many of the recent developments that we've been seeing. And we've done quite a lot of work on horizon scanning more broadly, trying to inform ourselves of new technology developments and how those might affect markets, how that might, those might affect competition and consumers. And this, this set of developments is clearly of great importance for all of those, uh, all of those aspects. So we wanted to try and get ahead a bit, try and understand the market as it's developing, rather than having to come along later and work out what's happened. Uh, it's an initial review, so we uh, took four, four months or so taking stock at, the, at three levels of the market. First, the development of foundation models themselves, secondly, the deployment of the models, and thirdly, the consumer experience. And we tried to think about the kinds of more positive or less positive outcomes that might emerge for competition and consumers and then put forward a set of proposed principles to try and help guide the market towards the, towards the more positive outcomes. And sorry to be the uh, classic journalist focusing on the negatives, but what could go wrong if you aren't kind of watching closely, if you weren't? I mean, what kind of potential risks did you did really leap out at you in your initial study? I mean, they're really the, the sort of classic issues we tend to worry about, both on the competition and the consumer side. On the, on the competition side, if you have market power building up, that can result in uh, less effective competition, less innovation, perhaps worse outcomes for consumers. You can get more direct bad outcomes for consumers. So for example, we looked at issues like uh, fake reviews, where we, we, have a, we have an existing case actually using our consumer enforcement powers, but where there's a big question as to whether generative AI foundation models will actually exacerbate some of the harms that we're seeing in the current set of markets or whether they could make them better, and it could go either way. What we tried to do was strike a balance and understand what might push the market towards more positive outcomes and what, what might push towards the more negative outcomes. Certainly not wanting to pronounce, certainly not wanting to predict the future, perhaps not even wanting to be too firm on the present, given how fast things are developing. And the biggest AI foundation models, we had Anthropic here earlier today, they are startups often, but they are already very much embraced and funded by big tech, uh, who also own and operate the big cloud platforms, content distribution, social media. So does that already sort of ring alarm bells to you that you've kind of already got this vertical, vertically integrated structure, arguably, and you know, the kind of more Im imminent risk of bundling and things like that? So we're seeing a, you know, a variety of structures, as you say, some, some very vertically integrated companies, others where the labs are more independent, but they have certain arrangements with some of the cloud providers, for example. We did think very hard about the, really what are the key inputs to those to those models and the development of the models. And we would want to see easy, ready, ready access to the various inputs on, um, uh, on fair terms for, for a variety of companies, whether independent or, or vertically integrated, again, to get, to, to get the best outcomes. So not preferential access to the likes of OpenAI by Microsoft, for example? Well, it all depends on the nature of, of those, those relationships. I think it's a bit, again, a bit hard to, to call it either way so far, but we're looking quite closely at those ver vertical relationships, thinking about, as we always do in those kinds of scenarios, whether there is the incentive and the ability to, to restrict access to various kinds of inputs, whether that's in terms of compute or data 
or, or other inputs. And again, thinking about the, the, how effective the competition is at the development of models and then also the deployment layer, noting, of course, that at the deployment layer, a lot still is yet to happen. So we're, we're seeing some things being tested and rolled out, others not yet rolled out, whether you're thinking about in search or in productivity software or other markets. Are you but able to interrogate the terms of some of these big fundraisings and deals that we've been seeing in the foundation AI models? Sort of see what, what terms are involved for the big tech companies? Uh, up, up to a point, yes. I mean, that's something that we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on over the, over the coming months and years, I suspect. Thank you. Um, so the digital markets unit that you run uh, still doesn't have any powers, uh, technically, until the government passes the Digital Markets Act, um, which is expected sometime in the next few months. Um, have you been keeping busy anyway? You're not twiddling your thumbs, presumably. So, um, you know, will we see a raft of decisions come out when, when the law is passed? So we've got an awful lot of work going on in preparation for, that, for those new responsibilities that you mentioned. Uh, that's all of the sort of work you'd expect in terms of thinking about how we'll actually implement the, the framework. In the bill, we're required to produce quite a lot of guidance on how we will actually implement the, uh, those responsibilities. We, we can't start producing that guidance until the bill reach, reaches the right point, but at that stage, we will, we will do that, and that will be, for example, explaining what we, what we, how we interpret this strategic market status concept beyond the broad framework that's written in the bill, how firms will be able to engage. We want to set out our stall in terms of really wanting to talk to and hear from an enormous range of companies, whether it's the prospective SMS candidates or challenger tech or civil society, et cetera. Uh, so there'll be a, there's a lot to do internally for now and then externally in, in the fullness of time to explain how we think that should work and try and invite all of that kind of input. We're also, as you'd expect, uh, preparing in terms of just our operational readiness, so that includes recruiting uh, and trying to get the right blend of skills in, technical, economics, law, um, all that. I mean, things. that must be challenging because the CMA is a part of the civil service, ultimately, and so you're sort of restrained by its wage structure. So is it difficult to sort of attract and keep the people that are going to be taking the fight to big tech uh, if they can go and, go and work for them? Well, I suspect anyone who's uh, in the market for data scientists, data engineers, et cetera, would probably, uh, would probably profess a certain degree of um, discomfort with their ability to attract the right people. I actually think we're doing pretty well. Uh, we have a really good team in our, it's called the data unit, the data uh, and technology analytics unit that contains data scientists, data engineers, behavioral scientists, as well as all our economists and lawyers and so forth. And we think that that, that is in a, in a pretty good place at the moment to be able to help us develop the kind of technical expertise and understanding we need. But I'm certainly not complacent for all the reasons you, you describe. We, we think there's a lot, a lot to be said for uh, the interest and the impact of our work and the, the sort of public service ethos that drives a lot of the people at the, uh, that work at the CMA. But you know, in the end, it's also a, a commercial marketplace for talent and we're, we're in that just as much as anyone else. Can you talk to us just very briefly about this um, SMS strategic market status concept and, you know, as much as you can say what this will mean, sort of what kind of firms you anticipate being designated and how many, for example, is it really just going to be sort of a handful or could it be dozens or, you know, any kind of insight into that? Would yeah, thank you. So it's intended to be a high bar, as we understand it in the bill. Uh, the concepts in, our, in there are substantial and entrenched market power and a position of strategic significance. So this is, this is I'm not sure, I, I tend to use the same phrase, a handful of firms, okay. we're not talking huge numbers. And as with any of our work across any of our powers, we're look, we'll be looking to find uh, the greatest impact. So where the markets are biggest and the harm is likely to be greatest, where there may be that most significant market power, uh, which is restricting markets, limiting innovation, uh, holding back competition. And I think you can see you know, hints of where that might be from work we've done so far. So, for example, we did a big study on digital advertising markets covering search and social media, and we did a big study similarly on mobile ecosystems. And already in those studies, we explained that those would be, we thought, at least decent candidates for, uh, for that SMS status. I think you described the mobile ecosystem as a stranglehold from uh, Google and Apple. Oh, so, yeah. Google and uh, I, think, I think the phrase we looked at using our press release was a, a vice-like grip of the two, vice -like grip. Apple, okay. and, <laughs> Apple and, and Google in their respective ecosystems. Yeah. And um, uh, th those are indeed the sorts of, the sorts of uh, challenges we'd be looking at. And theoretically, that could also go for the, you know, that could also apply to AI models. 
strategic market status? Uh, well, I think it, the, so the bill is, is happily very flexible. It, it describes broad concepts rather than talking about specific technologies. So we think it has a reasonable prospect of being fairly future-proof. AI, of course, is going to be relevant to pretty much all of the markets that we might look at, you know, whether it's the specific market for the models themselves or whether it's search or, or other markets as well. But I think it could, you know, in keeping with what, what I said about our report uh, that we produced in September, you know, there are, there are arguments either way, and we'll need to take, take uh, you know, to take a careful evidence-based assessment of those, those arguments. In search, for example, there's an argument that says that AI-enabled services are going to come and sweep away Google's position in search. I mean, that was the, that was the argument that was being put forward by some people a year ago when uh, ChatGPT launched. There are other, other arguments the other way, which is that actually these new technologies can just help entrench some of the existing positions. We haven't taken a view on that, and at the point of actually doing a, uh, an assessment of strategic market status in, in search, then we'll obviously have to come take, a, take a position on that. The uh, Digital Markets uh, and Competition and Consumers Bill, um, there's a lot of reporting about it. Rishi Sunak is uh, you know, being lobbied by technology companies for to give them a stronger route to appeal than just a sort of technical judicial review. Um, we wrote a story about it today saying that it may, maybe he's not going to do that and he's going to stick with the judicial review. But um, you know, what would um, a, that a stronger right to appeal mean for your work uh, and enforcement? Would you have to be more careful, more conservative if they had that sort of full merits right of appeal? So look, you heard the Secretary of State talk about this just earlier. Uh, it's the government's bill, and there's a long way to go, to go in Parliament. And th the main thing we can do is take a view on the bill as it's been put forward. And uh, in our view, the, the structure that's set out in that bill strikes a good balance. It's not just the, the, the court review process. There's a whole set of accountability measures. Internal accountability in terms of reserve decision-making to our board and to a board committee, so that, for example, an individual like me can't can't individually take any one of those most significant decisions. That's in parliamentary accountability. Uh, we ex will we expect to be held to account by, no doubt, a combination of different committees in parliament. And then there's the court review process. And the important thing for us is that we think that the, the judicial review standard that's, been, that's in the bill is already a tough, robust standard. It, a, lot, a lot of ink gets spilled suggesting that it's a sort of light touch check uh, and I, de I suspect not many people in the audience would have spent time reading the judgment in the Meta Giphy merger appeal uh, hearing. But if you did go and read it, you'd find 100 pages of uh, thinking from the court on not just, the, just the, the, uh, the process that we followed and whether we did that right, but also our analytic, analytical <coughs> approach, whether we looked at the right evidence, how we went about doing that. So I think anyone who read that would come away thinking, actually, this is a pretty tough and robust standard. Who'd have thought that the highest justices and uh, lawyers in the land would have been spending so many pages on, on GIFs? There we go. Um, the spotlight's kind of rarely been on the CMA as much as it has been in recent months after Microsoft Activision. Now, we're not going to go into the mechanics of why CMA took certain decisions, but some people have put to me that this review of judicial review or you know, big tech appeal is sort of maybe a kind of a political blowback after that for the CMA. So I just wondered you know, how you... How you, what you make of that, and are you dealing with an increased amount of political and business pressure, um, basically, since that deal came to, came to the public? So, look, we, we always do our job based on the evidence. That's what, absolutely what drives us. And the same was true in that case as it is in every other merger case and anything else we do. Uh, and we are uh, independent from politics. Uh, that decision was just as independent from politics as anything else that we do is and we're, we think that's really important and we stick by that. It doesn't affect your, your job at all, the sort of Microsoft uh, weighing in in the, in the media and Chancellor making statements about how regulation should work? We listen to companies on all sides of the argument and, as I said, we always come back to what the evidence says to us. And in that case, the, the evidence said to us that there was a worry about cloud gaming. We stuck to that worry. We blocked the original deal on that basis. And then when a, a new deal was presented where a remedy was, had been found to that problem, that was what we were happy to accept. Great. I've got Microsoft Activision there at the end. Anyway, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, Will. I hope that was interesting.